We know enough about psychology now to know that almost all of the positive emotion that you're going to experience in your life, and positive emotion is analgesic, by the way, right? It actually quells pain. So it's not just positive. It also gets rid of negative, which is a big plus. Almost all the positive emotion that you're going to feel, you're going to feel in relationship to a goal. Because you feel positive emotion as you approach a goal. And so if you want to feel positive emotion, then you need a goal. And then you might think, well, if you want to maximize that positive emotion, which is enthusiasm and also what pulls you out into the world as well as feeling good, then you need the best possible goal. Well, that, because that's going to engage the largest segments of your being. Like if your goal is too narrow, then a bunch of you isn't going to be on board for it, you know? If the goal is well-developed and multifaceted, then all of you can partake in that. Even your negative elements, even your anger and, and, and your fear can get on board with that, let's say. So you need a goal, man, that's worthy. You've got to think. You, could, you need a goal that justifies the tragedy and malevolence of life. That seems to be the bottom line. Now, maybe you think, well, there's no goal that can do that. It's like, well... There are still better and worse goals. So, and I, I'm not convinced that there are no goals that can do that. I think that's an open question. You'd never know that until you pursued the proper goal long enough to find out who you would be as a consequence of pursuing it. So that's also your destiny or your existential voyage, right? It's also not something that anyone else can do for you. Someone can say, get your act together for Christ's sake and get, it, get, get at it. That's... That'll make the world unfold best for you, but there's no way you can know that without doing it. So, and unless you think you've done a particularly stellar job of that, then you have no reason to doubt its potential validity. So, plus, like, crickets are telling you this, and so, (laughs) you know, they're a very reliable source. Okay, so you see the star, the star recurs as a motif in Pinocchio, and one of the more interesting elements of it here is that when Geppetto wants to transform his puppet, the marionette who's being played by forces that operate behind the scenes, which is a really good definition of the persona from a Jungian perspective, right? And also something indicative of something like an ideological or conceptual possession. Geppetto, who's a good guy, he's a positive father figure, re- lifts his, even though he's a patriarchal figure, right? and a very competent one, he still even lifts his eyes up to something that transcends his mode of being, positive as it is, and wishes that his creation would undertake the kind of transformation that would make it autonomous and fully functional as a moral agent. No strings, right? So that's very interesting, I think. Solzhenitsyn said, the salvation of mankind lies only in making everything the concern of all. That's a pretty decent star-like goal, I would say. And so what happens in the Pinocchio story is that because, and I think this is a symbolic representative of what I just described to you that happens at a genetic level if you put yourself in new situations. So Geppetto is roughly culture in the Pinocchio story, right? He's, he's a craftsman, he's, he's a, and, and he makes Pinocchio. So he's... he's who's his son. He's the socializing agent. And he aims for something above mere socialization, which is, I think, part of the mysterious element of human beings. You know, in our scientific models, we basically have socialization and biology. But there's always a third element in mythological stories, which is whatever you might construe as the spontaneous action of consciousness that's associated with free will. And, you know, that's just basically being conceptualized in religious terms as something akin to the soul. Now, we don't have a category for that scientifically because what we try to do scientifically is to reduce everything either to socialization or to biology. But it isn't clear to me that that's... It's perfectly reasonable from the perspective of practicality at a scientific level. You don't want to multiply explanatory principles beyond necessity. But there's many things that that doesn't come to terms with, such as the fact that we all treat each other as autonomous beings with free will, and that that seems to work, and that if we stop doing that, then things go to hell very, very rapidly. So, and the mere fact that we have been able to conceptualize what that conscious free will might be, metaphysically or physically, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that we don't understand it. I mean, 
what, it was only in the last 15 years that we discovered that 95% of the universe was made out of some kind of matter that we can't even, whose properties we can't even imagine, except that it seems to have mass. So, anyways, what happens is when Geppetto reach, lifts his eyes up to the star, he, so it's society aligning itself with the proper goal with regards to individual development, right? So, so there, instead of society being at odds with the individual, they line up. And then what happens is nature comes on board, and that's the blue fairy in the, in the Pinocchio story, and that seems to me to be a symbolic representation of what happens biologically when, when you set the goal properly, get your culture behind you and move into the world, is that there's a biological transformation that occurs as a consequence of that, which means that a bunch of you that hasn't been turned on, turns on. And I guess one question would be is, what would you be like if you turned on everything inside of you that could be turned on? Well, that's a good goal. That's a good thing to find out. So, now, I'm going to introduce a couple of other ideas. So, there's this idea in Jungian psychology called the circumambulation. And Jung had this idea that you had a potential future self, which would be, in potential, everything that you could be. And that it manifests itself moment to moment in your present life by making you interested in things. And the things that you're interested in are the things that would guide you along the path that would lead you to maximal development. Now, it sounds like a metaphysical idea or a or a mystical idea even, but, but it's not. It's, it's not. It's a really profoundly biological idea. The idea is something like, well, you're set up so that you're automatically interested in those things that would fully expand you as a well-adapted creature. Well, like, there's nothing radical about that idea. How el what else could possibly be the case? Unless there's something fundamentally flawed about you, that is what the the situation would be. It's kind of interesting to think about how that would be manifest moment to moment, but the idea is something like, well, your interest is captured by those things that lead you down the path of development. Well, that better be the case. Okay, so that's fine. And so there's some utility in pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's the call to adventure, let's say. So, and the call to adventure takes you all sorts of places. Now, the problem with the call to adventure is, like, what the hell do you know? you might be interested in things that are kind of warped and bent. And often it's the case that when new parts of people manifest themselves and grip their interests, say, they do it very badly and shoddily. And so you stumble around like an idiot when you try to do something new. That's why the fool is the precursor to the savior from the, from the symbolic perspectives, because you have to be a fool before you can be a master. And if you're not willing to be a fool, then you can't be a master. So, so you're going to... It's, it's an error, <clears throat> error-ridden process. And that's also laid out in the Old Testament stories because the first thing that happens to all these patriarchal figures when God kicks them out of their father's house when they're like 84 is that they, they run into all sorts of trouble. And some of it's social and some of it's natural and some of it's a consequence of their own moral inadequacy. So they're fools. And, but, but the thing that's so interesting is that despite the fact that they're fools, they're still supposed to go on the adventure and that they're capable of learning enough as a consequence of moving forward on the adventure so that they straighten themselves out across time. And so it's something like this. So this circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual, we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And... There might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea. Because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea. And which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until... 
It's waiting for Godot until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally and work with it and so and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny and you can assume that you're going to do it badly and that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up it's pretty easy to do it badly